Hi, Year 12. This week we're looking at phobias. We have to study phobias from a behavioural uh, point of view. Once we've done that, it'll take us right up to half term. Uh, and then we'll start to look at the other two remaining abnormalities that we have to focus on, which are depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, for phobias, like I said, we've got to explain it from a behavioural point of view. We've got to look at the treatment as well. So these lessons will only focus on phobias and that will last us um, the entirety of this week. So here's our objectives for this lesson. We're ultimately explaining something called the two process model. We have to explain how phobias develop through classical conditioning. And then we've got to explain how phobias are maintained through operant conditioning. We only need to know one piece of actual research. It's by a man called Watson who used Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning to uh, ultimately make a young child develop a phobia to demonstrate how if we learn through association, phobias can develop. Um, there's additional reading as well that I've put on class charts for you. So it's there in the bottom, the stretch and challenge. Um, you don't necessarily have to read them for the purpose of this lesson, but if you're a little bit interested about Watson's ideas and his research surrounding how um, emotions can be affected through associations and through classical conditioning, then you have that, um, that information to access. If you haven't done so far, it might be worthwhile just having a quick skim through your notes on behavioral psychology, in particular Pavlov and Skinner. You don't need to read about Bandura's uh, ideas for the purpose of this two process model. But a lot of the key terms and the concepts that we'll be referring to during this lesson are things that we've already covered at the very first few weeks of the course. So it might be more beneficial for you just to get it back into your working memory from your long-term memory. So last lesson, I asked you to uh, focus on the emotional, the behavioral, and the cognitive characteristics for phobias, depression, and OCD. These characteristics are really important because that's what a doctor or a psychiatrist would be looking at when deciding whether or not to diagnose, diagnose a person as suffering from a phobia, having depression, or suffering from obsessive compulsive disorder. And ultimately, you need to know them for the purpose of the exam. I'll show you an exam question in just a moment. So we need to look and consider the mental state associated with the abnormality. So thinking about the emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. So if we can identify those characteristics and how they're associated with phobias, depression, or OCD. Behavioral characteristics, probably the easiest characteristics to identify. Um, because we can actually physically observe a person's behavior. So the actions that are associated with phobias, depression, and OCD, and the cognitive, which is probably the most difficult, cognitive characteristics, because these are the thought processes that are associated with each abnormality. And we would only be able to recognize the cognitive processes really through self-disclosure, through a patient actually telling us what they are currently thinking. Now here's... The cognitive, the behavioral, and the emotional characteristics for phobias, depression, and OCD. What I would ask you to do now, if we were in the classroom, is I would print this out for you and I'd ask you to highlight them and associate them with phobias, depression, and OCD. So highlight the three boxes that relate to phobias, the three for depression, the three for OCD. But also ask you to identify not only if it belongs to phobias, but is it emotional, is it cognitive, or is it behavioral? And the same applies to depression and the same applies to OCD. So you can have a pause the video now and read each one and decide. You can number these or if you have the PowerPoint, you can edit the PowerPoint or print the slide off and complete this activity. I'll go through the answers in just a second. Okay, we'll go through the answers. Like I said, it's always easiest to focus on behavioral characteristics. These often appear as multiple choice questions and behavioral characteristics are the easiest to identify because we're looking at things that we can actually physically observe um, and monitor in a person uh, and how the, you know, in the characteristics, the, the activities that the person is carrying out. So with phobias, we know that people avoid the situation. So they might show characteristics of flight, running away from the stimulus or freezing. Quite easy to identify when somebody is physically scared because their behavior will change. Behavioral characteristics for depression, a change in regular behavior, a change in appetite or a change in sleep patterns. So they might, their appetite might increase or decrease, such as comfort eating, 
um, or not eating at all. And the same with the sleep patterns. It could be that they decide that they, they, well, they struggle to get out of bed, they feel tired and lethargic, or they struggle to sleep entirely, like uh, insomnia. And for OCD, it's repetitive behaviours that must be carried out. So impulsiveness, tics, these could be physical or verbal. Now, if we then start to think about the cognitive aspects, we'll go back to phobias. Phobias, irrational beliefs about their fears, they have to be irrational. They can't be rational because that makes sense. They have to be something that does seem completely irrational. And importantly, the individual has to recognize that their beliefs are irrational. They've also likely to show resistance to rational arguments. Now for depression, the cognitive characteristics would be negative views about the world, about the future and about themselves. There's three different characteristics there. That is called the cognitive triad, which we will go and discuss in more detail when we cover depression. And for obsessive compulsive disorder, their thought processes, the cognitive characteristics, thoughts are intrusive, so they're unwanted. They have to be recognized as coming from the patient's own mind. And if they're not, it suggests it could be something like schizophrenia. And often these characteristics will be linked to germs, hygiene, or safety. So usually safety, something bad will happen if I do not carry out these repetitive behaviors that we've already identified. And then we'll go through the emotional characteristics, again, starting with phobias. Persistent fear and anxiety when presented with thinking of a stimulus or panic. For depression, it's sadness, low self-esteem, mood swings, uh, and maybe outbursts of anger. And last but not least, obsessive compulsive disorder, the emotional characteristics, anxiety and stress caused by intrusive thoughts, behaviours and potentially embarrassment. Sorry if you can hear uh, any additional noise. It's my dog is in the kitchen with me and he's, uh, he's playing with his toys at the moment. Um, However, here's a real exam question. This is from 2019. Now, with these characteristics, behavioral, emotional, and cognitive characteristics, like I said, they often ask it as a multiple choice question, which students seem to prefer compared to these more extended writing format questions. However, it's the format questions that are significantly easier than the multiple choice questions because the multiple choice questions, it's very easy to get the cognitive and the emotional characteristics modeled up. And if you're presented with the information, it's quite easy um, to accidentally write the wrong letter or identify the wrong um, characteristic, what you've been asked to identify. If we have a look at this question, outline two behavioral characteristics of depression for four marks. It does on the face of it appear like quite a difficult question because how do I achieve four marks by writing about just two characteristics, well, you just write in a correct manner. You write in full sentences and you identify two characteristics. And as long as you're going into enough detail, such as writing a full sentence and not writing down a one or two word answer, then you are likely to score four marks. So you can pause the video now, or if you're looking at the PowerPoint, you can attempt this on a Word document. I'm happy to, to look over these, or if you just want to self-assess yours, we're going to go through the answers in just a moment. And so I have a go at attempting that question, and we'll go through the answers together. Here's the mark scheme. So this is what examiners were provided with. So you get two marks for each characteristic, as long as it's co clear, coherent, and elaborated. One mark for a characteristic if it's limited or muddled. So the characteristics are the four bullet points that we're, we're potentially looking for. And then the elaboration is after the hyphen on each bullet point. So if you said a change in activity levels, you've scored one mark. And then if you elaborate and start to explain, it could be a lack of energy, withdrawal from activities that were once enjoyed, neglecting personal hygiene, or increased agitation, then that's your elaboration mark. Now, you can't necessarily say change in activity levels for one mark, increased, uh, leth increased lethargy or lack of energy, and then withdraw from activities to get three marks. It doesn't, um, doesn't work like that. Once you've said change in activities, that's one mark. You can only score one additional elaboration mark by referring to one of those points after the hyphen. Second characteristic, disruption to sleep. So you might have said sleep may reduce or increase. That can get you two marks. So disruption to sleep would be one mark and then the elaboration and explanation. Again, you wouldn't score three marks if you said disruption to sleep, increase and decrease. Disruption to eating behavior, again, increase or decrease. 
and you could refer to aggressive acts. So it could be acts of aggression often towards oneself, but you can refer to others. Oneself would be something like self-harm. Each bullet point can earn a maximum of two marks, except other relevant characteristics. Now here I'll just bring up the examiner's report. This question, according to the examiner's report, was answered exceptionally well by students across the country. Most students achieved full marks. However, a lot of students only achieved half marks by only referring to one characteristic, but talking uh, and elaborating in detail surrounding that one characteristic. So one surprisingly common approach was to combine changes to sleeping and eating patterns and present them as one symptom, which of course are not. So you've got to really make sure that you're separating each one of the characteristics and you're fully elaborating um, to make sure that you're scoring your elaboration mark. So now we're getting into uh, behavioral psychology. We're starting to think about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. What I'd like you to do for this starter activity, I'd like you to attempt either all three of these starters. However, if you think that one of them is a little more difficult than the others, you focus on the more difficult. I've put them there in a kind of podium. However, you might find that um, this podium doesn't represent necessarily how you're feeling. You go for what you feel is the most difficult. You can go for all three if you want. You can write your answers down on a piece of paper. We'll go through the answers together. Or you could just think about the question and how you would attempt to answer this question and pause the video. Okay, so we'll just quickly run through the answers. What does tabula rasa mean and how does it relate to behaviorism? Well, tabula rasa, remember it's a great key term to explain for a behavioral uh, approach. It means blank slate. A behavioral psychologist often believe that we are born as blank slates and all our behavior is influenced and determined by what we experience in the environment that we share. Explain the difference between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is the nice, easy one to remember. If you are rewarded, you are encouraged to do that behavior again, so that strengthens learning. Negative reinforcement often gets confused with punishment. Now, negative reinforcement also strengthens behavior, just like positive reinforcement, but it's by removing an unpleasant state. So Skinner used negative reinforcement with the rats, continuously electrocuting them, they accidentally press the button to stop the electric flow, and therefore they negatively reinforce that pressing the button is good. Remember, punishment stops behavior. Negative reinforcement, it says it in the name, it's encouraging that behavior to happen again. It's reinforcing the learning. And the last one I thought was the most difficult, gold. Explain what is meant by environmental determinism in relation to the behavioral approach. Well, it's kind of very similar to what we explained for tabula rasa. Environmental determinism is that your environment will determine your behavior. So behavioral psychologists place more emphasis on your environment rather than cognitive factors, um, biological factors, or psychodynamic um, factors. I say psychodynamic factors. I mean your unconscious mind, unconscious factors influencing your behavior. They believe that things like phobias can be purely explained just by what you have experienced and what you have learned. Now, because we're starting to think now in the sense of behavioral psychologists, we'll just think about classical conditioning. It's all to do with Pavlov, and Pavlov said that we learn everything through association. Well, therefore, we also must learn phobias through association. And we're going to start to use some of Pavlov's key terms now. So the phobia starts off as a neutral stimulus. Now, remember back to Pavlov's study. For the dogs, the bell was a completely neutral stimulus. It means nothing to the dogs. And according to this approach to explain phobias, all phobias start off as a neutral stimulus. So if you have a fear of spiders, at one stage in your life, a spider would have been a neutral stimulus. And you wouldn't have ha always had a fear of spiders. Only when the person experiences the neutral stimulus alongside an unconditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response does the learning develop or a phobia then develop because the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus which produces a conditioned response. Now we're going to apply that to Watson's research because that's what Watson did. He took little baby Albert 
Um, and he effectively used the theory of Pavlov, those same key terms, neutral stimulus, conditioned stimulus, uh, unconditioned response, conditioned response, etc., to see how little baby Albert develops phobias. Now, I'd like you to take notes, and I'd like you to be thinking about those key terms. The video I'm going to show to you now, um, or the, the video that's contained in the PowerPoint, is the one that I feel best explains a little bit of background to the study and talks um, it talks about what happened in a, in a nice, easy-to-follow manner. Um, you can watch the video back. Now, this is the second time I've actually tried filming this lesson because the first time the video crashed, so I'm not going to play the video in this lesson now. I'm just going to skip through it. But if you have the PowerPoint, if you've downloaded it, there's the video. Just click play. You can watch it two or three times if you'd like to. It's only about five minutes long. Um, and then you can start to uh, start to hopefully apply those key terms, which we're going to do on the next slide anyway. So by all means, if you need to, pause this video now, watch that video back a few times, then you can come back to this YouTube video and we'll continue with the lesson. So ultimately, this is hopefully what you've been able to take notes on. Little Albert, all babies were pre-programmed to not like the sound of loud noises. That is a biological response that we have. So it's an unconditioned stimulus. A loud noise makes us react. So a loud noise produces an unconditioned response, which is fear, anxiety, uncomfortable. And in little Albert's case, it was to make little Albert cry. When little Albert heard the noise, the unconditioned stimulus, the banging of the metal bar at the same time as a neutral stimulus was introduced, which is a white object, so it could be a rat, the clown mask, it could be uh, a white rabbit. He would produce the unconditioned response. And then through a process of association, he would associate the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned response, and therefore the neutral stimulus eventually becomes the conditioned stimulus, which produces a conditioned response. So even though Albert didn't hear the loud noise every time the white object was introduced by Watson, he would still associate those same fears, the anxiety, that uncomfortableness of hearing the loud noise with the white object, and it would be produced by viewing the white object on its own. And you can see in that video that when uh, Watson places the, the white rabbit or the white rat in front of Albert after conditioning, Little Albert's trying to escape, he's upset, he's crying, he's trying to crawl away. Whereas he wasn't doing that at the start of the experiment when the white object was a complete neutral stimulus. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to open up the next activity. So it's this activity sheet here, phobias and conditioning. There are four different examples on it. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to identify the unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, neutral stimulus, conditioned stimulus, and conditioned response in each case. However, it's not a simple case of just writing in the initials of the key term next to the example. I want you to read the example and then explain what could have been the neutral stimulus, what became the conditioned response, etc. So I'm going to show you an example now. We're going to go through the example one together. So Marie is terrified of dogs. Whenever she sees a dog or hears a dog barking, she becomes very anxious and shows obvious signs of stress. She avoids people's houses if she knows they have a dog and will no longer go to the park because people will walk their dogs there. She thinks this goes back to an incident when she was six years old and she was bitten by a neighbor's dog. So what I want you to do, and you can do it in the same format that I'm doing it here, just bullet points. We start off as the dog being the neutral stimulus. Even though in the opening paragraph, sorry, the opening sentence there, it says Marie is terrified of dogs. According to this approach, she hasn't always been terrified of dogs. She must have learned to become terrified of dogs. So at one point, a dog must have been a neutral stimulus. We also know later on, she was when she was six years old, she was bitten by a neighbor's dog. Now being bitten is an unconditioned stimulus, which produces an unconditioned response. Being bitten will produce pain, anxiety, and stress or distress, which is the unconditioned response. Now, because she was bitten by a dog, and the dog is the neutral stimulus, if we combine a dog to a bite, which produces pain, therefore, Marie will start to associate the dog with the pain, 
the dog becomes a conditioned stimulus which produces the same feelings of being bitten without actually being bitten. It produces the conditioned response. Now, in addition, the dog barking could contribute to this because again, like we've seen there with little Albert, the loud noise it makes people feel uncomfortable, especially young children. They don't like that loud noise. They don't like somebody making them jump or go into fight or flight response mode. And that often could explain why uh, people dislike or fear dogs. Because when dogs bark, it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you jump. That then becomes associated with the dog. And therefore, the dog becomes a conditioned stimulus, which produces a conditioned response. So that's what I'd like you to do for the remaining three examples. This is something similar that could come up in a smaller uh, a smaller exam question, maybe for four marks or six marks. They could give you a scenario like this and explain from a behavioral point of view. And it's always good to, to think about in this bullet point format before then you write in the full sentences. So far, we've only tackled that first learning objective. We've only explained the, uh, the development of phobias, but now we have to start to think about the maintenance of phobias. And this is where we bring in an additional psychologist called Mora, who said operant conditioning can explain how phobias effectively could get worse from an initial starting point. So hopefully now you feel a little more confident explaining the difference between positive, neg uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement and punishment. So Mora, here's the individual. And Morris said that every time a person with a phobia avoids the cause of their fear, so effectively runs away, uh, that should say, from their phobia, they negatively reinforce that that behavior is correct because the phobia puts the person in an unpleasant situation, an unpleasant state, and running away and avoiding their phobia relieves that negativity, relieves the unpleasantness, and it takes it away. So therefore, that maintains the phobias and it effectively makes the person believe that that is the best option, that is the best thing to do. And Morris said that the, not only will this be maintained in the phobia so that the learning doesn't become extinct from the initial uh, interaction, but it's likely that the phobia will only continue to get worse and become extremely debilitating. So a person only avoids these situations now, if we think about that scenario there that we've just looked at together, Marie, example one on the activity sheet, we know that she's avoiding parks, she's avoiding going around to people's houses if she knows that they've got dogs. That is negatively reinforcing that that behavior is correct. It's negatively reinforcing the phobia by relieving the anxiety caused by the fear of the dogs in the first place. So we can certainly see that it's been maintained from when Marie was six years old to being an adult it's also potentially getting worse by the fact that she's now avoiding parks. Could it get to a situation where she avoids going out at certain times of the day where she knows people might be walking their dogs, such as before school or before work and after school, after work? Could it be that she feels eventually that she can't leave her own house if her neighbours had a dog? So you can see how negatively reinforcing certain behaviours could make phobias significantly worse and more debilitating. Now, if we just start to think about the evaluations, we're not going into a lot of detail for the evaluations yet because we haven't looked at the treatments. And the treatments are one of the most significant advantages of this approach. But it makes sense. The behavioral approach is extremely logical and it's supported by research. So not only research by Watson, but it makes sense if we have other theories such as Skinner and Pavlov that are extremely reliable theories and pieces of research that they can be applied to explaining something like phobias. I've put there the treatment is effective. We haven't looked at the treatments yet, but the treatment is extremely effective. And that is a significant strength of this approach because the treatments are based upon the explanations. So the treatments identify if you can learn a phobia, therefore you can also unlearn it. And if that also works, potentially that provides a little bit of a little more validity to the, the explanations. We'll go through some of the weaknesses, however. Some psychologists suggest that we have a biological preparedness that keeps us alive and that we learn certain characteristics and certain behaviors more likely because of our biological preparedness. Now, this was Seligman. We did look at this as a major criticism of Pavlov's theory. Seligman argued that all dogs have a biological preparedness to learn associations with something that will aid their survival. And because Pavlov was using food 
a dog will quickly learn to associate a neutral stimulus with food because the, uh, the food is vital for a dog's survival. It has a biological preparedness to learn that behavior. However, if you try doing the same association with something that wasn't vital for the dog's survival, such as a pat on the head or a belly rub, then they're not necessarily going to learn, if at all, that same association. Now, in the context of phobias, a lot of phobias relate to, um, in, to, relate to activities or situations or animals, for instance, that could potentially have a significant threat to our life. And what you do have is a significant number of, um, of evolutionary psychologists who would argue that the fears that develop through phobias are not necessarily uh, learned, they're just maladaptive responses because phobias make sense. Now, if we just think about the key characteristic and def definitions of phobias, it's a phobia has to be an irrational fear of an event, situation, or activity. Now, what we're arguing here with this criticism is that if you had a phobia of spiders in Australia, it would not be classified as a phobia. It would make sense because spiders can kill you. The venom of spiders in Australia could literally threaten your life. So if you live in Australia and you suffer from arachnophobia, that would not necessarily be classified as a phobia because it is rational. And therefore, you have a biological preparedness maybe to fear spiders because they could harm and threaten your life. In this country, we still have that same biological characteristics, that biological preparedness as they would do in Australia. However, it's maladaptive here. It doesn't make as much sense because there isn't a direct threat. So it's not necessarily that you learn all these phobias. It's just a maladaptive response of something that's already innate and within us. These uh, by, uh, behavioral approaches, sorry, they, they completely ignore the cognitive aspects of phobias. They ignore the thinking um, that's surrounding. Even though we looked at the, uh, the, the cognitive characteristics, they kind of downplay these cognitive aspects of phobias. You know, the irrational thought processes that are involved in phobias, how they might be um, reluctant to hear the kind of rational or logical arguments. And from a cognitive psychological point of view, that is significant that we have to start to consider the thought processes and the maladaptive thought processes that are involved in how phobias develop. They're being completely ignored by behavioral psychologists, and it's something that has to be taken into consideration. Um, and one of the biggest issues is that not all phobias require traumas to develop. If you have to explain all phobias by having a starting point, such as Marie being bitten by a dog or Watson banging the bar behind little Albert and that being the starting point, the trauma that is the initial starting point for the phobias, then how do we explain some phobias that develop where a patient can't identify the start of their own phobia? They can't identify any specific incident or traumatic experience that they recognize as being the start of the phobia. And I think we have to accept that some phobias have developed without people being overtly aware and being able to, to consciously say that is the, the time and the place in which my phobia started to develop. So if we can't do that, then we can't necessarily say that all phobias were neutral stimuluses that then became associated with an unconditioned response um, you know, through association and therefore developed from that starting point. It suggests that potentially there could be other explanations that explain phobias better than behavioral approach if we can't find a starting point or a pre-existing trauma or incident. Now that's it for this lesson. Um, we we're just looking at the two process model and explanation. The next activities will be uh, looking at the treatment. So we'll do a little bit of a recap just to start off with some of those key terms and then we'll start to look at the treatments. And I've got a great documentary that I'd like you to watch, uh, which is about half an hour long, which focuses on some of these treatment methods um, to treat people who have a fear of heights, a fear of flying, um, and a fear of pigeons and a fear of feathers. Um, so we'll have a look at those in the next lesson.